Hello, and welcome back from networking. Hi, Monique. Hi. <laughs> um, I had a chance to do the networking, and I don't typically get to do that. It was really fun. I saw someone else in the chat say that they love networking and hopping, so that's already a good thing, I think. So you weren't the only one who had fun. <laughs> Um, I think one of the things that really struck me from my networking session is that um, I heard things like, this is helping me connect in different ways. And I am trying to um, think about how I take some of what I'm hearing today and moving it into my own work. So just, and, and then also, um, I think another piece about the networking is you can start to chat people directly from there too. So I've been hearing from some folks that I haven't had a chance to catch up with in a little while. So thank you everybody. Um, I'm really excited to move in to the second half of our program um, and hear from another group of incredible women who are trailblazing in their own ways. Um, and so I think that it's a, uh, I'm excited to listen in on, on what they have to say. Yeah, so we're going to have a roundtable discussion with a few, I mean, amazing women leaders. We'll be joined shortly by Allie Byrne, CEO of Village Capital, Christine Saintville, founder of Social Scoop, and Leticia Piguero, Vice President of Programs at the Nation Cummings Foundation. After that, we'll pop back in for Q&A, so keep these questions flowing in the chat, be engaged. When you hear something awesome, you know, do a double click on it by uh, yeah. posting it in the chat and, and <laughs> sh showing that, showing it, show you love, as they say. So uh, I think there will be obviously many tweetable gems that will come out of this conversation with these uh, amazing, amazing women leaders. So we'll shortly be joined by them and it'll be a conversation on navigating boss status with some bosses. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see you all in a second. Bye. Hello. Hi there. Hi, Leticia. I'm so excited about this. I know we're waiting for Allie to hop on, so hopefully she can jump yeah. in just a second. But I guess we can get started with just sharing a little bit about who we are. <laughs> so thank you all for having us, for allowing us to be here and share this space with you guys. I'm super excited. As um, we shared, I'm Christine Saintville. I'm the founder of The Social Scoop, which is a community for mompreneurs to help them leverage social media for their businesses. My most important job is being a mom to my three kids, 9, 11, and 13, and a wife of almost 16 years. Uh, we're also homeschool parents. So we can definitely talk quite a bit about this. We've been doing it almost eight years now, about eight years. And so looking forward to this discussion and sharing this space with these awesome women. So Leticia, I'll kick it over to you. Thank you, Christine. I am in awe of moms during this time. And the fact that you've been doing it for eight years, I, I, yeah. <laughs> Um, I am excited to be here. I'm Leticia Peguero. I'm the Vice President of Programs of the Nathan Cummings Foundation. And I also do um, executive and professional coaching specifically for women of color and philanthropy. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this conversation um, and to think about um, and to think and talk about how um, all of these issues, race and gender play into leadership, especially on Equal Pay Day. Ali, I'm going to pass it on to you. Hello, it's great to be here. Sorry, I was uh, having a bit of a tech issue, but I think we're, we're good to go now. Um, and it's wonderful to be in the company of these other two amazing women. Um, I'm Ali Burns. I lead Village Capital. Um, we invest in impact-driven companies, and uh, I've been in this role for uh, just a few years now, so um, it's been an it's been an interesting journey, and I know we're gonna touch on that. And I also want to add my deep admiration for all moms at this time. I, I only am a dog mom, um, and <laughs> that that is enough uh, <laughs> for the time being. So um, yeah, I'm like, really excited to have this discussion, and uh, yes, and happy Equal Pay Day. Well, listen, being a dog mom, I've, I've had some friends that have puppies and it's, it's, it's quite a challenge as well sometimes. So 
<laughs> nothing wrong with that. So let's just hop right into it, ladies. Um, you know, one of the things that we wanted to discuss was around, you know, our challenges and, you know, our own journeys. And so I know for me personally, you know, when I think about just even in my job as a social media coach and, you know, helping other women tell their stories online, you know, when I think about the journey, a lot of times, you know, you hear that quote about sometimes people look at, you know, your highlight reel and they think that there's, you know, you're, you can't possibly be going through all of these other things or you're, you know, you look good, you look great, but they don't really see the behind the scenes. They don't see the journey, um, the frustrations that we have to go through, you know, the things that we have to fight for. So I want to definitely go, get into sharing, you know, our own journeys. Um, and, you know, if you ladies want to just chime in and just talk about, you know, what has been your greatest challenge that, you know, you can think of over the years of, you know, being a boss, right? And what is the way that, or ways that you were able to overcome, you know, those challenges? Allie, you want to start? Sure. Um, I always, whenever I talk about this, this question, I always talk about the fact that my journey has certainly been not been linear. And I'm sure that's many of our experiences that uh, you, you leave a college and you think you're going to have this like specific trajectory. And that's not the way that it works out. Certainly not the way that that mine did. Um, I actually spent the first decade of my career probably not really knowing where I wanted to go. Um, I was in corporate communications and um, and I had the same reckoning a lot of people do who are in impact investing or philanthropy or in the social good space where I said, what the heck am I doing? I really want to do something that I, you know, that I feel like is contributing um, to the good of the world. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a really awesome boss. I was at AOL at the time during a very interesting uh, time in AOL's own journey, um, who, who pu pulled me aside and said, look, uh, I feel like you need to go do something else to boost your trajectory and to boost your career and do what you really want to do. And I happen to know someone who is in philanthropy who's looking for a communications director. Can I make an introduction? Um, and rarely are we so lucky to have bosses like that. Um, and she certainly was someone who was looking out for me and my career. And that really um, changed the trajectory of my career. I joined Steve and Jean Case, uh, uh, co-founder and early executive at AOL in their family philanthropy, but very quickly had a front row seat to their work in impact investing, um, their the building of their traditional venture capital arm revolution, and um, had this really fascinating opportunity to discover what I was passionate about was this intersection of innovation, early stage entrepreneurship, uh, investing, and, uh, and impact, um, and found my way to Village Capital about five years ago. Um, had I not, again, had I not had that boss that pulled me aside, I would not have done that. The other, in the contemplating what my greatest challenge is, um, I think it was myself, um, you know, doubting myself when I came over to Village Capital, I took on the role as COO. I'd never been a COO before. I was in communications. I knew how to lead teams, but I, I needed some time to process the applicability of the role that I had previously to this entirely new role running an organization. I kind of went through the same uh, testing of myself and my confidence in myself when I took on the, when I was asked to take on the CEO role. Um, and I, I know that's something that, that we all wrestle with, um, the sort of self-confidence um, to, uh, to make a leap um, that men usually don't even spend a second thinking about. So <laughs> that's certainly the story of my journey. Yeah, you said um, so much. I don't know if you, you had anything to chime on to that, Leticia, as well, you know, and sharing your journey. But I think so many people can definitely relate to just not trusting yourself. And I think, you know, as we get into the conversation, it will, you know, show up in different ways. But definitely I can relate to that as well. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I'll just say that, um, you know, I am first generation in my family to go to college and, and, and English actually was not my first language. And so as I think about the journey of, you know, my journey both here and thinking about like 
is college for me? Is this something that I do, that I should do? Ali, I totally um, resonate with the idea that I thought I was I actually thought I was going to go to college and become a teacher. Um, I have great respect for teachers and thought this is this is something that I should do that I want to do, um, and fell into philanthropy by accident. You know, totally by accident. This idea that there was someone there who saw something in me and said. Have you thought that this is possible? Um, I actually didn't even know what philanthropy was. Uh, so it wasn't just uh, an amazing opportunity. It was also discovering that there was this whole other world um, that I think really needed organizers and people that were coming from the sectors that we were trying to impact to, to lend their voice to it. So I you know, really resonate with what you said. Um, I'd love to ask a question, if I may. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I actually started with the idea of equal pay day. And, you know, I was reminded of that this morning. I forgot that today is the day that we actually, and I'm, I wrote this down here, that um, white women um, have to work uh, to earn the same that men did last year, right? So white women would have to work all the way till today to earn the same, generally speaking, that, that men earned last year. For black women, it's August 13th. For Latinas, it's October 29th. And for um, Native American and indigenous women, it's October 1st. Um, so we see, right, the, the, the sort of built-in structural inequities that are that are um, part of our system. And I'm just really wondering from, from you both, how has race and gender um, played into the way that you um, see yourselves, the way that you position yourselves, and the way that your leadership shows up um, in your respective fields? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll just share a little bit of my, you know, my background and how I got into you know, my industry, because it really is across industries that I see. And so, you know, for me, it actually started like you, like both of you ladies, I went to school for biology. So most people are like, oh, did you go to communications marketing? No, none of that. <laughs> I thought I was going to go to chiropractic school, then decided my senior year, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, and so I ended up actually, you know, part of my journey, a big part of my journey is when I left corporate um, because it was, you know, there was discrimination there. I, I was just in a very just not a good environment. And so, you know, becoming a stay-at-home mom to three kids under three at the time was just definitely a self-discovery um, moment for me. And so part of my journey was being able to, you know, figure out who I was and what I wanted to do. So I started a blog in 2012. And that's kind of, that's really how I got started in social media and marketing and being able to, you know, tell my story and help other women do the same. And so, you know, one of the things that I've seen definitely, I mean, we, I was just on Clubhouse the other day and they were having this exact conversation, you know, because we'll see, there was a lot of um, things that blew up last year because of the pandemic and, you know, people and, you know, Black Lives Matter and just people seeing even as an influencer, you know, how many, how much less they were getting paid as Black influencers versus white counterparts. And, you know, some of them, you know, really going to these brands and saying, how are you going to change this, right? And so I think that having more of these conversations, um, putting more of these, you know, out there for people to, to um, have a discussion about like we're doing today is really important. So, you know, we can really, you know, figure out how we can move the needle forward, right? So, how, you know, me, you know, I try to talk to other agency owners, like, hey, what are you doing? How are you finding your influencers? You know, I'm looking for, you know, multicultural influencers for this client, like, who do you know, right? And then, you know, allowing other people to, you know, be able to give me their references. But I think it's so important that we look beyond what we're comfortable with and what we know and find and find ways to be more inclusive. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say maybe it's sort of speaking to the journey too on um, awareness um, around race and gender in pay. Um, on the gender side in my own journey, um, I had no idea about the that the pay gap even existed probably for the first decade of my career. And I was in a pretty female dominated industry in marketing and communication, particularly communications and PR. Um, and I was again, fortunate to have a lot of really awesome role models, but nobody ever talked about compensation. So I had no idea until someone pulled me aside much later in my career and said, 
uh, who was an advisor for us and said, you need to ask for a lot more money. Like, you, you know, you, you need to understand, like, there is a big gap. If you compared yourself to other peers and particularly your male peers, you should be aware of that. And so that was part of like a slow awakening for me, um, recognizing that the gap existed. Um, but I was late to the party and I would give myself not a good grade on recognizing intersectionality and recognizing that the pay gap is different um, along racial lines as well. And that um, someone like me is responsible for bringing everybody along. Like it's not enough to acknowledge equal pay day for white women. We've got to acknowledge exactly what you just did, Leticia, and say like, it's not right until we've fixed it for all women. We all need, to, we need to bring everybody to the same line. Um, and that's something that um, that I'm doing a lot more of and trying to speak out a lot more about um, and learn a lot more about as well. Thank you for saying that, Ali. I, um, like you, I had no idea how to negotiate salaries. Um, and actually, I'll say, didn't feel that it was my right um, to, to do it um, until I met um, the amazing uh, Dr. Deborah Perez, um, who was at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation when I was a fellow. And so I got into philanthropy, like I said, by chance. I was a National Urban Fellow. And she said to me, come, come, come hang out with me for 10 months, um, be a fellow. And I remember being like, in Princeton, New Jersey, um, like for ten months, really. Um, and but I, 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 I went, and it and it changed my life. Um, but one of the things that she taught me was how to negotiate. Um, and I remember her telling me um, that the idea that um, the offer that they make is the offer you should accept is. Um, I won't say the word here, right? It's, <laughs> and I was like, I remember being like, to, like, what do you do? Do I push back? But what if they then they take it away, right? So I think, you know, I really appreciate this conversation because I think one, we don't get taught as women, and oftentimes our own relationships with money, right? Uh, both as women and as people of color. Ali, I really appreciate you bringing in the word intersectionality, right? Like the way that these things intersect feel um, insurmountable until someone teaches you um, the tricks. And I always say in philanthropy in particular, which is, you know, particularly not a particularly diverse space, um, that, you know, the things that um, men, ask for, um, I have to like actually sit down and think about, right? Um, before I go in and, and oftentimes men are like, yeah, of course, <laughs> right? Of course, this is what I'm supposed to be getting the salary, the amount. So um, for sure, you know, I think how do we then mentor, right? The, the next generation to come to be, like I always like to say ballers, right? In these spaces, so. Yeah, I th I think uh, I think it's so important for us to pass along those lessons to the women that work for us. One of the things I I have a lot of challenges with the nonprofit space, but one of the things that is nice is that we have to be transparent about salaries. Uh, we are we are forced to report on our compensation, um, and so that requires us to be really intentional um, about uh, communicating how salaries. Uh, operate in the organization and encouraging people to really understand that. Um, but but yeah, so I wanted to ask a question as well. Um, and, uh, and that is, um, you know, the last year we've been going through. Um, we're, you know, we're just over a year um, in a global pandemic and there are signs of hope on the horizon, certainly, but uh, there's also reminders every day uh, my colleagues in Kenya, for example, are about to go back on on lockdown. That this is still very much with us, and I'm I'm just curious. We've seen a lot of reports and headlines about how the pandemic has impacted women disproportionately, and curious how what you're seeing, both for yourselves personally and professionally, but also amongst the the women that you work with and the women in your life, and 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 how we are coping and how we recover. Yeah, I think that's such an important, you know, 
question and, and this is, you know, important conversation because I think this last year has forced people, I think, to, you know, Leticia was saying earlier about being authentic, like being more authentic with what you're going through and what you're doing. Like I've seen so many more people sharing their stories, which allows other people to share, you know what, I'm really not okay. <laughs> and that's okay. And I think that that's really the first piece is that mostly women were always forced to just do it, um, work through anything, um, you know, show up anyway, you know, and just be the strong person. And so I think this last year has, you know, for me personally, definitely allowed me to focus more on the things that are important. You know, being more intentional with personal relationships, for sure. You know, for our kids, it's been about finding ways because, you know, I mean, they're they're going through it too, right? They miss their friends. They, you know, they, they miss the activities that they're doing. So finding more ways to be more creative, more fun, you know, more intentional with the time. You know, it has been, we, we went back to playing, you know, board games, right? And Uno and just stuff that was not, you know, on tablets, stuff that was going to allow us to connect. You know, we started implementing, you know, we have these cards that have like, right, like, speaking points, right? So that sparks conversations so that we can, you know, keep it going and just open the communication. And I found that that has been so critical, especially now, because so many people are going through so much. I know that someone was sharing a stat with me recently about, you know, the mental health, um, especially of children and even adults has gone way up, you know, in the last year. And so, you know, making sure that we're open with communication for me in terms of um, business and professionally, it has definitely opened doors to really see and figure out how I can help, you know, my community with being less stress, right? So taking away less stress from what they're doing, which caused me to start a membership, right? For my mompreneurs, it's like, okay, let me help you, right? And then also it helps me because I'm not, I'm, you know, it's less work on this end, you know, to be able to um, pull everybody into a membership. But I think that it's important to also be able to, and I know we'll talk about collaboration, but, you know, I think that this last year has really opened doors to, you know, really communicate and focus on the things that matter. Um, and so for me, it's been more like oh, eye opening, right? To say like, I'm tripping and I'm worried about all of these things over here. And these are the things that are really important. Yeah, I, you know, this year um, has been about slow and deliberate movement, literal movement. Um, an intention, and it's showed up showing up for me personally. Um, and and I was sharing with a group of folks yesterday. I I've I've been a big yoga practitioner for for years, and then for some reason stopped. And this past year have really dedicated, you know, five days a week at this. I will do this. Um, working on some hard poses that have not come through just yet, <laughs> knock on wood. Um, but this idea of, of like, why did I stop? Because uh, I was busy, because I was working, because we had dockets, because we had to move money out the door, because I had to work late, even when I got home after I walked the dog. I'm a dog mom too, Allie. Um, and this year has been to some extent about slow and deliberate intention. Um, like Christine, you said, right, like intention with my relationships too, checking up on people. How are you? How are you doing? And also in our team, I manage a big team at Nathan Cummings. Like, what were we not doing before? Um, what does it mean to create space for people to be tired, for people to be off screen? the new culture of being on screen all the time. I mean, I find it particularly exhausting. Um, how do we normalize um, that it's okay? Um, you know, the other, a couple of weeks ago, it was like, if people wanna be laying down while we have this meeting, feel free, right, to do that. Um, so that it doesn't, you know, we know that people are probably not fully dressed, only from the waist up. So let's just admit it and, you know, it's okay, right? If you want to lay down for this meeting. And I think little things like that um, have helped me show up more authentically, but also taking care of the people. We have, I have moms on our team, um, ch little children, big kids, you know, teenagers with very different needs. And to say, how, how can I help you show up for your family first in this moment? 
And I know you're going to get the work done, right? We're, we're, we're a social justice philanthropy. We saw our work as really important in this moment of racial uprising to get the money out. We're going to do that. But like, take a mental health day uh, or two or be off screen. Like, what's the slow and intentional work that we have to do to, to show up the way we want to, which I think is really different than, than lots of male leadership, not, not all of them, uh, but, but for lots of folks, this like idea of slowness, of intention, of steadiness, I think feels really important in this, in this past year for me. I agree. I would love to hear some of your coping mechanisms, Allie, as well, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, I love that uh, slow and intentional. Um, I've definitely found that um, I need to be more intentional about self-care, um, not having a commute, not having the types of boundaries that I think we take for granted or took for granted uh, pre-COVID has been important. So um, I have a... Um, my coach gave me this tool. Uh, uh, it's supposed to be a four square, but it's more like a six square of things that I have to do every day to make sure that I'm taking care of myself. Um, so it's a mix of, you know, meditate, it's like staying hydrated, meditating, exercising, um, sleeping well. Those are, it's crazy that I have to remind myself that those are things that I have to do every day, but really being intentional about like, these are non-negotiables. These are things that I'm going to do no matter what. Um, that's been uh, super helpful for our team. Also encouraging people, you know, I, I think about the shift of everybody keep your cameras on and the all hands so we can all see each other in March of 2020 versus now. It's like, if you're speaking, it'd be great if you can turn your camera on, but it's totally cool if you're just a picture in a square and you need to do what you need to do to, to deal with the fact that we're all on video for six to eight hours a day, it feels like. so. Um, certainly encouraging our team also to take advantage of we have a very flexible time off policy and um, trying to find mental health resources for folks. Um, people have different access to different types of resource. Um, and I try to be really transparent about everything that I'm doing um, to take care of myself so that uh, I'm setting an example. And Leticia, I really appreciated your comment too about uh, male leadership not always having uh being rooted in empathy um i think uh which which i think has been to the advantage of women leaders and i we, we see that at a macro level in uh geography in, in countries that are led by women um but also i think we're going to see a lot of uh research that shows that organizations uh who have uh, i don't want to use the word thrived because i don't know that anybody has thrived but have, that have uh come through the pandemic uh stronger probably have more diverse leadership teams um, than those that don't be my guess. Thanks for sharing. I appreciate it. You said a, a key word that I love using and that's non-negotiable. And I think that we definitely have to be clear about what our non-negotiables are because it's so easy for people to overstep those boundaries like you were saying, Ali. So super, super important. So we'll switch gears a little bit. One of my favorite uh, African proverbs is we can go fast alone or far together. So I would love to talk a little bit more about collaboration and what we can do as women to support each other on our individual journeys, as well as, you know, as we help each other raise to boss status. So Leticia, I'll let you start and I'll come back around. Sure. Yeah, I love that proverb. Um, so I think a lot about... Um, you know, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Tia Oros Peters, she runs the Seventh Generation um, Fund. And one of the things that she says all the time is, you know, this work is not about me, right? It's, it's about seven generations in the past and seven generations in the future. And, um, and to me, that sort of epitomizes the way that I think about collaboration, right? I think it's really easy, especially in the West, for us to get caught in like, um, this work is about me. It needs to have my name on it. You know, it, it's it's very um, the the driving force of capitalism, right? And I think this notion of are there ways that actually this work, sure, it's about me in this moment because I'm talking, right? I'm I'm here in the in the on the stage, um, but this work is also about 
all the women, right? This work is about, I've been thinking a lot about grandmothers lately. This work is about all the women in my life, including my grandmother who's still alive and is 95, who did not have the privilege that I do today. And so how do we engage and create the causes and the conditions that allow me to be in this position for now? Um, and, and, and lead in that way, right? Understanding that the baton will be passed. And if I don't share the resources and, and I don't engage in sort of open conversation, communication, transparency, um, then, then the baton might not be passed, right? To, to, the, to the next generation. So I do think you know, there are tools that we use in-house, but I think this idea of collaborative leadership, and I'll just name one more person who taught me a beautiful concept um, not so long ago, um, Elizabeth Yampierre, who works in climate justice based out of Brooklyn, New York, talks a lot about leaderful moments, right? So we believe in leaderful moments so that when I am tired, I can step back and Ali and Christine can step in. And when Christine's tired, or maybe you just need a day off, right? You can step back and I can step in. And then I can call Ali and say, Ali, I am exhausted, or I wanna go on vacation. Um, can you step in? And so this idea that's different than leadership, it's about how do we engage in leaderful uh, movements. And that's part of what we've been really trying to do and what I've been trying to put forward at at NCF. I love that, leaderful. Um, I was gonna talk about two, I think separate, but related things. Um, one is about decision-making. Um, and I think um, this is uh, something that we are rethinking collectively as a society is like, is the way that, is the way that we define power and give people power to make decisions uh, the right way? Um, and uh, something we've been running at Village Capital for the last 10 years is an experiment and what happens if you actually change power dynamics in investment decision-making? We run a peer-selected investment decision-making process and um, it's probably not gonna shock anybody to know that that has led to a far more diverse portfolio, um, particularly when it comes to um, women-led companies, but also um, in terms of where the companies are located and who is leading them um, both on um, race and ethnicity as well. And um, so that's a question that I'm starting to ask myself in like all other aspects of life too, is like, how do you change decision-making? We're asking ourselves that question internally. Like, do we need to have the same decision-making structure that every other organization does? And where I think that goes to um, with, with women and collaboration, one of our barriers to collaborating often is this perception that there are only a few seats at the table. Um, and so we can, I think many times just subconsciously um, be trying to uh, not recognize that we're not fighting for a seat at the table that we need, you know, this is something that a lot of other amazing women have said, like we need to build a new table. Um, and I'm really thinking about how to do that um, more intentionally um, in my life um, and, and find the tables where other amazing women are that I'd love a seat at as well. So um, those are just a few of the thoughts on my mind. I love that. And I'll just share quickly, you know, for me, collaboration is just part of my culture. It's just what I'm automatically always looking for ways to collaborate. So sometimes it might be with someone who has, you know, a, uh, uh, product or service that might complement what I do. Um, so, you know, I've collaborated with, you know, someone who owns their own makeup line. Um, you know, I've collaborated with people who, you know, might offer email services, email marketing services. We just do social media, right? So what are, who are some people that you, you know, have complementary services or products to you that you guys can either create one product um, one joint product, or you can become like affiliates or spokespeople for each other and push each other's audiences to each other. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share was just around, um, you know, offering similar products, right? So if, if you want to 
collaborate with people who offer similar products, you can do that as well. But, you know, maybe it's just there's some, you know, there might be a gap between what you serve, you know, what you offer and what they offer and how can you kind of bridge the gap maybe to create one product. So, you know, even with, you know, something new that I'm launching, I look to your point, you know, I love that what you said, Leticia, about leader full, because I feel like that's like how it is. Like, I'm always trying to find, hey, I'm working on a new project now. And I'm like, it's three of us. And I'm like, okay, so you take the lead on that. I'll take this. You take that. I think the more that we can do that, um, you know, just the more um, the more that we can see, you know, make progress in this, you know, arena of collaboration and allowing people to feel like it's it's for everyone. When I win, you win and vice versa. Yeah. And that it's like a natural byproduct, right, of of success in, in sort of the new world that we're that we're heading into uh, post pandemic. Um, I know we're short on time, but wanted to give us an opportunity to give, you know, some quick advice um, to folks listening um, from your perspectives. Christine, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure. So I'll make it quick. I think one of, you know, the biggest thing that I always go back to, I co-wrote a book with my sister and the last chapter is called Do It Afraid. And I always go back to that because I think with any level of success, with anything that you're starting, there's always going to be a level of fear. There's always going to be a level of, do I know enough? Ali spoke about that earlier. And that's always the case. I'm like, oh, wait, I don't know, especially in my area where everyone's online, everyone has a persona, everyone seems to know more than they probably do, right? And, you know, in this space sometimes. And so it makes you feel like you don't know enough. And I think, you know, just doing it anyway, even if you don't feel like you have the answers, because the only way to figure them out and find them out is to just get going. I would echo that 100% and add um, some advice someone gave to me, Jean Case gave to me years ago, which is build your own personal board of directors. Um, think about who you want to be in your life and help think strategically. And this is a combination of your professional career and your personal life. Who do you admire um, that would want to be part of uh, helping you think through strategies for your career and your life? And that's been uh, incredible um, to have my own personal board of directors. So that's definitely advice I'd give anybody. Yeah, I love the, that in, in philanthropy, we oftentimes call it the kitchen cabinet, right? Who's your kitchen cabinet of folks? And also, do they tell you the truth, right? That's <laughs> So that's hard. Sometimes when you're the boss, people that tell you, you know, I always say when I first got into philanthropy, I was like so popular. I dressed really well. My hair always looked good. Um, and I had fabulous shoes all the time. And it and I got realized that actually that wasn't true. That was what people were telling me. I don't know. Maybe my hair looked good all the time. Um, maybe. Um, my my advice um, is is find define your values and help them, have them help ground you, right? Um, Christine, you, you mentioned non-negotiables earlier, right? And sometimes it's really hard to know what your negotiable and non-negotiables are if you're unclear about your personal mission, vision, and values. It's easy, right, to, to sway. Um, so figure out what your values are and let that ground you so you know when to walk away, when to take a leap, when to ask questions of your kitchen cabinet, um, you know, when to change your kitchen cabinet if they're telling you that you're, you know, that you're fabulous all the time when maybe you are not or when you are fabulous and you're thinking that you are not, right? So um, find, define your values and let that ground you. All right. I, I could just keep going I all know. day. <laughs> this is so nice. But I love that. <laughs> Values are big. So I love that you, you ended with that. <laughs> well, I think we were going to go into Q&A. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm happy to ask another question, but <laughs> <laughs> or tell another joke. <laughs> well, there's Carrie. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hopping in for Q&A. Um, I just have to say, first of all, that I um, am so moved by this conversation because there are so many truths that you have been speaking 
that um, as I've been standing here listening, I'm feeling the like roll off of me and I'm like little weights coming off of me as I hear you speak them. And I think that that's just such incredible medicine that we all likely need right now. And so I am just deeply grateful to the three of you for joining today in bringing that to us. Um, so I'm, I'm a little, I'm moved. And so I felt like I really wanted to say that um, right now before we got started. I, I saw a great question that came in and I wanted to um, have us kind of pop into that one to get started. But the question was um, how, uh, 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 oops, of course, you know, now I've lost the question. Um, how do you foster connections with coworkers during the pandemic? And how do team meetings, like how are you doing that through team meetings and in other ways? I can go really quickly. Um, so for us, we do our team meetings, you know, weekly. And it's, you know, we just do Google Hangout, but, you know, most majority of the time is cameras off. Um, but, you know, some of the things that we've tried to do is really, you know, I ask them, you know, about their goals. What are they working on outside of work that we have to do for the clients? Because I want to be able to help them reach some of their goals. So just finding more about, you know, how we can support each other, you know, as a team. And, you know, there's so many, and then when they start sharing, it's so amazing to hear all of the things that they have going on and being able to support them in that. So I think sometimes it's also about, you know, building that connection, that personal connection, you know, to know like, what else do you have going on? Are there challenges outside of work, you know, that I can help support or someone on the team can help support? So that's been, you know, great, definitely over the last year to get to um, do a little more of. Yeah, and I'll add, you know, one, we do, um, we call them, a program team check-in um, Monday Monday mornings, top of the day. And, and one of the things that's worked really well is we facilitate, um, we rotate facilitation. And the opening question can be anything, like how many plants do you have in your house? Um, to, um, you know, lately it's been, you know, let's talk about anti-monopoly, right? And, and the cases that are in the courts. Um, and so it's been a really wonderful way to expand what people are engaging in. We share, we also share readings, like this is what I'm reading, um, this is what I'm watching, including, um, you know, I always say I, I watch terrible sci-fi. So, you know, it, it can be like intellectual stuff. It could also be like, you know, I watched three episodes of Dark Matter this weekend, don't recommend it, but, you know, it's terrible and delicious, right? So I think both like the seriousness of, you know, an article by the Roosevelt Institute and then like, come join me, let's do a watch party um, uh, for Dark Matter has been a really nice way to get people to be in community with each other. Well, that I'd, I'd only add a very practical thing that we've used for those who have Slack um, as an internal tool is a plugin called Donut, and it actually randomly pairs you up or pairs two people, three people up to have an informal coffee um, or virtual coffee. Um, so you're getting to connect with people from other teams and across the organization. And they give you like warm up questions in case you're like, I have no idea what to talk about other than work. So it's a really great tool. And then I personally try to have coffees with we also rotate facilitators for our all hands meetings and I try to have coffee in the half an hour um, with whoever the facilitator is just to keep connected with everybody in the org too. Nice. Um, I have another question that's been um, kind of one of the things particularly that Monique and I talk about a lot, but thinking about um, leadership and redefining structure and what leadership what does it even mean? You know, it's centralized. There's can be masculine energy. You know, how are we leaning into empathy and and what is usually considered a feminine trait um, that we can be pulling forward and really helping to encourage more of? Yeah, I, you know, I really appreciate the question. I think. 
part of it for me has been that the, it, it's such a binary, right? Like it's either like the masculine trade or the feminine trade and who wants to be associated with what. And I think for, for me, it's been, you know, how do I lead from a place that's about justice? <laughs> um, how do I think about the people that are in front of me, their families, their histories? Um, how do I believe again that like this isn't about me? Um, and how how do I uh, acknowledge the structures that get in the way? Um, and so I think without being able to acknowledge capitalism, it, it doesn't make me an anti-capitalist. It just makes me someone who's willing to acknowledge the deficits in the system, racism, patriarchy. Like without calling those into the room, we actually can't grapple with them. Um, in a way uh, that is authentic, we we have very superficial conversations, right? We we everybody's all into DEI right now, and that's good, bad. You know, I, I won't tell you my theory on it, but um, I, this idea that we're going to have a conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion without talking about structural racism and the harm that it's caused feels like an opportunity, like um a missed opportunity. So from my perspective, it would be how do we um, lead from a place of justice, a place of um, equity, a place of not centering uh, my ego, but also bring into the room like the things that we actually do have to talk about to be different kinds of leaders and organizations. I just want to give that a big standing ovation. Uh, I am actually dressed on the bottom, so <laughs> I'm wearing jeans today. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, I think it, it, in the chat too, and I mentioned this word before, sort of leading with empathy. Um, and I do think that that historically, I don't think it has to be a feminine trait, but I think it's been historically associated as a a feminine trait. Um, and I think that that has leading with empathy has shown itself to be a really effective tool for people as they're going, th they've been going through this past year, people are a lot more motivated. I've seen um, when they feel like you actually understand what I'm, if you can't understand what I'm going through, you at least understand that I'm going through something. Um, and that has been incredibly important. Um, and then I, I, I also think like redefining what leadership means and how decisions to making structures work to this this uh, point of like questioning traditional structures um, and and um, directly addressing the harms that traditional structures have done um, for lots of people. And so we're going through our own process of saying like, how do we make not only make decision making more inclusive, but how do we give more people ownership of decisions that make more sense for them to own versus Somewhat, you know, four people who are in this sort of C-suite, um, and uh, how do we do that and also pay them uh, appropriately for making those decisions as well? So I am, will be delighted to report back on that process. Um, and it's a it's a long one, um, but in six months uh, for anyone who's interested too. So I think it's going to be it's it's going to be fun and also challenging. Yeah, you ladies said it all. I loved and agree with, with both of you. And I'll just piggyback off of you, Ali, in that for me over the last year, especially, leadership has looked like delegation, right? And to your point, you know, being able to lean on people on my team who have expertise, who know what they're doing, and allowing them to take the reins and own, you know, a project, own, you know, whatever it is that we're doing and and allow them, you know, be able to trust that they're going to do it. Like, you know, they may not do it exactly like me, but I trust, you know, in working with them and seeing what they're capable of doing that they'll be able to do it. So I think sometimes, you know, being able to let go a little bit and like you said, bring in people who have expertise, right? Who could be making better decision, decisions than you are, but you're not allowing them the opportunity to do that. Oh, thank you all. I, I have one last rapid fire question. Tweet length, if you can make it. Um, but what is one thing leaders can do tomorrow to be better leaders? Who wants to go first? <laughs> That's a good one. I'll just, just thinking about, you know, 
building our relationship and communication with our in our family and our, our kids, I think listen, right? So sometimes it's as simple as asking your team, what do they need? What don't they have? How can they, you know, what are some things or resources that they don't have that would make their jobs easier? I think sometimes we fail to ask these questions as leaders and it could be something so simple that it's like, oh, if I had known, but sometimes they don't feel like they have the opportunity to actually share. Tweet length is hard for like a Puerto Rican from the Bronx. So I'll, I'll, I'll but I'm, I'm going to try. Um, ask yourself the question, why am I doing this work? And then ground, right? And listen, <laughs> like actually ask the question and don't intellectualize too much. Like listen to what you hear. Um, yeah, why am I doing this work and listen? Those were both of mine, so I don't know if there's going to be tweet length, but if everybody, but particularly if you're in a position of privilege, call out your privilege uh, and acknowledge it. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I think that um, is where we will end it for today, but I don't know about anyone else. I could stay here and listen to this conversation forever. Um, there is so much that we were unpacking together and that um, you've been able to bring to us to think about and um, hopefully create more action. So um, again, deep gratitude and thanks for joining us today and taking the time out of your very busy boss schedules. Um, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. This is amazing. Thank you.